<laughs> We're going to go ahead and get started if everyone's ready. I'm Amy Coney Barrett, and I am a judge on the Seventh Circuit. And I am particularly delighted to moderate this panel because before I was a judge, I was a law professor, and I spent some of my time thinking and writing about our topic for today, stare decisis. So stare decisis is a bedrock principle of our system, and it has many benefits. It produce, produces stability in the law. It promotes efficiency because judges don't have to reinvent the wheel. And it increases the public's confidence in the impartiality of the law. But stare decisis also has its kinks. And so we are going to solve all of stare decisis' problems today with our all-star panel. We've got John Baker, who is a distinguished scholar and longtime law professor himself. John has written about former Chief Justice Rehnquist's approach to precedent. We have Canon Shanmugam, who is a partner at Williams and Connolly and one of the nation's most prominent appellate lawyers. And we have Neil Eggleston, who is a partner at Kirkland and Ellis and has an impressive record of public service, most recently as uh, President Obama's White House counsel. I am going to keep each of them to the best, to best of my ability to eight minutes because we'd like to save the balance of the time for Q&A from the audience. We're going to start with John. Thank you, Judge Barrett. A couple of years before he was confirmed as Chief Justice, then Justice Rehnquist came to the LSU Law School, and one of my colleagues asked him about his views on precedent and stare decisis. Well, it was obvious that the justice had been asked this question before because he had a very ready reply. He said, well, if a case has been decided a year or two ago by 5-4, I don't give it much weight. But you better have a very good argument if you want to overturn Marbury versus Madison. <laughs> Thank you for the laugh. I appreciate that. But more than the laugh, there, is, there are actually a couple of important lessons from what he said. For one thing, not long after, his famous opinion in National League of Cities versus Ussery, decided 5-4, was overturned by Garcia versus San Antonio Metro, 5-4. Now, I think the only thing that he agreed on with the five that voted against him was they all agreed that a recent precedent doesn't have a whole lot of weight in the Supreme Court if it's decided 5-4. But there's also something else that you may not have noticed. At least implicit in what he said about Marbury is that it's primarily a precedent. And indeed, law schools for 90 years or more have really approached it this way. And a lot of people often don't even think about it. And it's both on the right and the left is what we call judicial review since the beginning of the 20th century. Is that really grounded just in Marbury or is it grounded in the Constitution? There are many on the right who believe, at least historically, that it's illegitimate and therefore we have to restrain it. And there are many on the left who believe it's illegitimate and we need to expand it. But either way, <laughs> either way, they don't think it's really legitimate. On the contrary, however, Justice Scalia used to say, quite rightly, that Marshall merely plagiarized Marbury from Federalist 78. Now, you may wonder, since this is the section on litigation, what all this has to do with most of you, because most of you are actually litigating in the lower federal courts and the chance of getting the Supreme Court is very slim, and I'm being told I better speed up. <laughs> I hope to tell you, lead you to the notion that there's a lot you can do with precedent if you understand its background. So three quick points I want to go over. Understanding the nature of precedent and stare decisis at the time the Constitution was written. Two, how separation of powers changes our understanding. And three, what you can do with this in the lower federal courts. At the time of the founding, first uh, point, there's a broad common law background, yes, but Britain has moved from the notion of precedent as primarily customary 
to really that it is tied to parliament. That is, after the revolution of 1689, the notion of precedent hardens, and it hardens because when a court has a holding and the parliament does nothing, the precedent becomes law, not because of the courts, but because of parliament's inaction equated with action. Going along with this was their attitude about opinions. Opinions were essentially seriatim. Each judge wrote an opinion. And what was the holding was the holding that they basically agreed on. The rest of it was opinion, just opinion. That's all it was. Well, when we get to the Constitution, yes, it is true that, of course, Hamilton says in Federalist 78, that judges are to be bound down strictly by precedent. But what did he mean? Well, for one thing, all of the Federalists thought that the common law background was actually in some way incorporated into the Constitution. That was one thing. Two, separation of powers obviously changes that link to Parliament. Parliament's no longer. Courts in the federal system are now under separation of powers distinct. Instead of answering to parliament, they're supposed to be answering to the Constitution. But this posed a problem for Marshall. What's the common law of the Constitution? The Constitution doesn't explain itself. It's like a blueprint, that's all. The Mar Marshall set out to have unanimous opinions in which he explained everything. And later, story wrote his commentaries on the Constitution, which, according to his son, said that Story set out to combine the Constitution, the Marshall Court decisions, and the Federalist. The Federalist explains the blueprint. And so you had that background that educated lawyers until at least the Civil War because of the commentaries on the Constitution. But all of that gets replaced beginning at the end of the 19th century with progressivism and Holmes and others talking about law as judge-made law. That's the biggest change that occurs. It comes through all of the law schools. Now, what can you do as lower court litigators and lower court judges? And I have one minute to tell you this. You may have noticed that we have a number of new originalist Court of Appeals judges. Given a narrow understanding of holding, which you already know anyway when you try to distinguish facts and holdings, it would be useful to many of these judges if not only in plotting the holdings of the existing precedents from the Supreme Court in your circuit, you try to give them alternative explanations that are originalist in nature so that what comes from the lawyers will go through the lower courts, and they in turn will feed it up to the Supreme Court. Thank you very much. Great, well good afternoon. My name is Cannon Chanmingham, and it's a great pleasure to be back at the National Lawyers Convention and to be part of this um, really incredible panel, and it's a particular pleasure to be here with Judge Barrett, who clerked for Justice Scalia the year before I did, and who in fact interviewed me. Um, Judge, welcome back to Washington, and I hope uh, you'll come back for good sometime soon. Yeah. Uh, As the, uh, uh, there's this cliche that uh, uh, everyone will be aware of about eating Chinese food, and I was sort of reminded of that cliche when I was asked to serve on a panel about stare decisis. I think um, attending a panel on a subject like this uh, will be satisfying while you're here, but you'll probably be hungry in about 30 minutes, um, because this is one of those hopelessly amorphous topics, um, no criticism of the Federalist Society, it's just inherent in the nature of this concept. And so I thought I'd start by offering a few reflections as a practicing lawyer, and as a lawyer who practices perhaps most visibly in the Supreme Court, but really primarily in the courts of appeals and occasionally in district courts, 
uh, as well. Perhaps it makes sense to just sort of start with um, some thoughts about what we're talking about here. Um, I'm a former uh, Latin major, so I always love it when I'm asked to talk about um, a subject in Latin, and stare decisis is, of course, uh, a Latin phrase, and it literally means to stand by what has been decided. Um, actually, for the people who are real Latin nerds, uh, decisis is in the ablative um, form, and uh, that can actually mean a variety of things. It can mean to stand by your decisions or with your decisions, or best of all, to stand on your decisions. And, um, and that is really what we're discussing today, and it's an issue that can arise, as Professor Baker said, in a wide range of contexts. Um, historically, scholars have distinguished between vertical stare decisis and horizontal stare decisis. In my view, I'm not sure that vertical stare decisis is really stare decisis at all. It's just the basic notion that lower courts are bound by decisions from higher courts. And that is a principle that is effectively embedded in the Constitution. It's really embedded in Article 3, Section 1, which distinguishes between the Supreme Court and inferior courts, the implication being that inferior courts really ought to listen to the Supreme Court. And um, uh, at, at, at least most courts of appeals tend to do that. Um, what we're really talking about when we're talking about stare decisis, I think, is horizontal stare decisis. And as Judge Barrett has pointed out in her really thoughtful articles on this subject, what that means really varies depending on the level of court that you're at. Um, if you're a district court, it doesn't really mean very much at all because district judges are not bound even by decisions by other judges within their districts. Um, and similarly, the Supreme Court applies um, a stare decisis um, in a less than uh, uh, entirely binding way, and I'll talk about that in a minute. I think where stare decisis actually has the most force in our system is at the Court of Appeals level where there is a pretty established rule that where a prior panel has decided a question of law, a subsequent panel is bound by that decision and that uh, rule of law can only be overturned by the Bank court and I will come back to that uh, in a minute as well. I really wanna talk about two aspects of stare decisis in my opening remarks and I'm sure we'll talk about others uh, as the panel proceeds. First, let me talk about um, the Supreme Court, and in particular about stare decisis in the constitutional area, the subject that Professor Baker focused on. Um, this is usually what people are talking about when they talk about stare decisis, and uh, it is, of course, the most visible uh, area in which stare decisis is, uh, uh, is discussed. And the Supreme Court has articulated a set of factors to be taken into account uh, in the analysis. Now, the Supreme Court standard is a notoriously pliable one, and that is probably inevitable because as nice as it would be to reduce stare decisis to a set of scientific criteria, um, that would probably be a hopeless aspiration. Um, and one might wonder why we have a doctrine of stare decisis at all. After all, our judges and justices take an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution. They don't take an oath to uphold and defend the United States reports or uh, the federal reporter. Um, and yet, uh, if we were not to have stare decisis at all, I think we would all agree that that would be um, an unfortunate outcome because after all, as Judge Barrett put in one of her articles, uh, a new majority cannot impose its vision with only votes. If judges gave no heed to prior precedents, uh, uh, the uh, uh, law would be uncertain, there would be uh, a, a constant vacillation depending on the preferences of individual judges and justices. And so I think all agree that stare decisis serves important values. The challenge, of course, is in figuring out how to apply uh, the criteria, and the Supreme Court has articulated criteria that sort of fall into, into two categories. The court has made clear that merely concluding that a decision is incorrect is insufficient. You have to have a special uh, justification to overturn a prior precedent. And those justifications have fell into two categories. There are those that relate to the merits of an underlying decision. Uh, was the decision not just incorrect, but profoundly so? Has it been called into question by subsequent decisions? Did it employ an improper methodology in reaching its result? And uh, the court has sort of focused on those considerations uh, to some extent. And the court has also focused on more pragmatic considerations, such as the workability of past precedent uh, and uh, the issue of reliance. And the court has uniformly held that reliance is a relevant consideration 
even though it's a consideration that by definition comes into play only in a subset of cases and really only primarily in cases involving uh, individual rights and really only in cases where prior decisions have recognized individual rights. It's hard to know how the concept of reliance would apply in the context of structural constitutional principles. You know, if you're dealing with, say, a question of administrative law, is the reliance of uh, a, a low-level uh, administrative uh, officer on a deference doctrine reliance in the sense that the Supreme Court thinks? Um, I think probably not, but that is a consideration that, again, the court has, has uniformly applied. I want to offer a quick thesis, and then I'll just identify uh, with uh, the judge's leave um, uh, 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 one thought about the other principal area of stare decisis. I think that a lot of the Supreme Court's considerations really boil down to a focus on notice, and a focus on notice to parties and to the world at large that the court is considering reconsidering a past precedent. And I think that that is really what animates a number of the factors in the court's stare decisis framework. The court really wants the world to be aware of the possibility that it's going to reconsider a precedent so that, it can, so that parties can adjust their behavior and to give parties and amici the opportunity to weigh in before the court, in fact, uh, does so. Let me say just a word about the other principal area of stare decisis, courts of appeals. It is true that the articulated rule at the court of appeals level is that a panel will not revisit a prior legal holding without en banc review. But in my experience as a litigator, that is a rule that is very much honored in the breach rather than the observance. Um, in the words of one commentator, uh, panels often make nitpicky distinctions about cases, aggressively characterize statements and prior opinions as dicta, ignore inconsistent authority, or reject or disregard such authority without expressly overruling it. And again, in my experience, I think that where panels want to avoid earlier decisions uh, on the Court of Appeals level, uh, they uh, have many ways of doing so. And I think one of the real problems in our system at the Court of Appeals level is that Court of Appeals do not police inconsistencies among panel decisions as aggressively as, in my view, they should. The end bank mechanism exists both to police those inconsistencies and to revisit prior incorrect decisions but it is used incredibly sparingly. In this country last year, there were only 36 en bank oral arguments. That's fewer in the entire country uh, en bank arguments than there were cert grants at the Supreme Court level. And as a result, I think one thing that we see is continued uh, disuniformity and an unwillingness of courts of appeals to correct incorrect decisions and instead a desire to leave that uh, to the Supreme Court. So I'm sure we'll discuss all these topics as we get into the discussion, but again, it's great to be here. Thank you very much. I'm a little taller, I'll raise this a little bit. So I'm Neil Eggleston. I mentioned to Dean Reuter before I got up here that um, obviously I'm out of the Obama administration. I probably otherwise would not be attending these lunches, uh, except for being invited periodically to be on the panels. I've told Dean uh, before, as I say before we started, that people always treat me politely in these uh, circumstances, but they always look at me in bemusement about how wrong I am. And uh, so I anticipate that will happen again, and, I'm, and I'll tell you, I'm fine with it, so as, as, as long as you are. Uh, so as you might guess, I'm thinking about this topic a little uh, uh, differently uh, over the last uh, year because of the recent installation of two uh, justices. Um, and, and I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, Judge Barrett gave some reasons for the, the rationale for stare decisis. I actually think about it in a little more of a global sense, which is that, it, that it's a recognition that the Supreme Court is an institution and that it's been around for hundreds of years and it's had, um, uh, you Supreme Court walks are probably better th at this than I am, but I think the Chief Justice may have changed how to count justices recently. He's counting uh, chief justices differently than the associate justices, but I think there have been 110, roughly, uh, justices of the Supreme Court. They were all got their seats through the same constitutional process that the current group of nine has. And I think part of uh, the, the concept of stare decisis is the recognition that the court does not exist for the current members at all, but exists in a continuum. And at the risk of using a little of my time, so I was in the Clinton administration in the White House Counsel's Office, and 
uh, left and then had the fortune to come back and, and work in the Obama administration. And the first time I didn't sense this, but the second time I very much sensed this, which is it's the same building that we left at the end of the Clinton administration. The Bush administration occupied it in between. In the Clinton administration, we were just temporary tenants. The Bush administration was temporary tenants. And in the Obama administration, we were temporary tenants. And we had a duty to the institution. I felt much more strongly, I think, having come back again. And I uh, uh, would just urge uh, you know, sort of people to think about the value of the institution and how important stare decisis is to, uh, to that. And let me make one other point, which I think uh, may sound simplistic, but I think also matters, which is all nominees at their confirmation hearings talk about how important stare decisis is. That's one of their key notes. And it's because the Democrats are all worried about certain cases and the Republicans don't, uh, senators don't really care as long as they get confirmed if they're Republican uh, nominees. Um, but, but stare decisis applies when the justice would not decide the case the same way. That's what it means. You don't need stare decisis if you're the justice and you would decide the case the same way without stare decisis. This is a reason to go a different direction than you might have been. That's the whole function of, of stare decisis. And the court um, has developed a whole series, as uh, Cannon said, of precedents about how to deal with that and how to think through uh, when a, a, a separation from a prior precedent uh, might uh, be appropriate. I'm a little worried, having read a fair amount of the literature related to stare decisis that's come out in the last couple of years, that stare decisis and originalism are starting to uh, interact uh, with each other. Uh, that there's become a sense that the prior justices didn't recognize this superior method of interpreting the Constitution. I think Professor Baker made some reference or an oblique reference to this, that somehow the prior justices didn't have the benefit of this superior method of interpreting the Constitution, which is originalism, and so that the prior decisions are not as worthy of respect as other decisions might be in the originalist era. I just want to warn everybody, you know, theories come and theories go, and justices get appointed and justices don't get appointed, but it remains the same institution throughout, and uh, decisions that are rendered now will be subject to review in the future, and a disrespect for stare decisis is not limited uh, to the, only to the current time. Um, I guess the other thing, just uh, um, talking a little bit about the institution, and I really think that the Supreme Court is in a bit of a, of a uh, fork in the road, if you will, which is we've seen, and it's not just over the last two years, it's over a significantly longer period of time, but that the other two branches of government aren't really functioning very well. Um, I don't think that the Congress is gonna function any better, frankly, with the Democratic House and a Republican Senate. In fact, it may in some ways uh, function even worse than it would before. Uh, the presidency obviously is an area that we read about in the paper every day. I think the Supreme Court has to think very hard about whether it is become, going to become enmeshed in the partisan morass or whether it's gonna continue to be an institution of enormous respect. Um, uh, and I think that how the court deals with stare decisis, particularly in cases that the public might otherwise think of as essentially partisan cases, it is important. If they start reversing a bunch of decisions by 5-4, whether they're recent decisions or not recent decisions, um, then I think that uh, the, the court has a real risk of losing what I still think is quite a high stature and position in the country. And I think that one of our institutions should have that, and I would really not like uh, the Supreme Court to uh, delve down to the level of the other two at the moment. So anyway, I care enormously. I also clerked in the Supreme Court, although many uh, chief justices ago for Chief Justice uh, uh, Berger. Uh, and I'm enormously fond of that year and I'm enormously fond of the institution. You know, uh, I recommended Merrick Garland to President Obama to be a justice. Uh, and uh, you know, there are a lot of people who think the latest, nobody in this room obviously, but a lot of people in the country think the latest two justices shouldn't actually be sitting in their seats. And, um, and I just think that we have to be really careful at this time because I think the institution can suffer for, for lack of recognition, frankly, of the importance of uh, stare decisis. So thank you.
Well, I'm going to exercise the moderator's prerogative of asking each of our panelists a question, and then we can open the floor and take some questions from the audience that the panelists can um, then answer and get a conversation going. So I'll start with John Baker. And my question for you, John, you talked about the Federalist Papers and you know a, a historical view of stare decisis. So do you think that stare decisis is constitutionally required? constitutionally required in that we would put it to a decision, or do you mean that it is part of the constitutional framework? Part of the constitutional, part of the constitutional framework, in the sense that if, if courts, you know, as part of, part of the judicial power under Article Three, so that if they entirely ignored precedents, that they would actually be acting contrary to the Constitution. I, I believe that, and, and that Federal 78 is an answer to Brutus. And Brutus, the anti-federalist, was arguing they could do, they would be the supreme power. And that's why Hamilton is assuring them that they're going to be tied down. My point only was that our understanding of precedent today and their understanding was not the same. OK, so this next one is for Cannon. Um, Cannon and I talked a little bit about this before the panel, so I thought I would ask him uh, to speak a little bit about it now. And that is how, as a litigator who practices in the courts of appeals, he finds unpublished opinions um, and, and their role in precedent. Yeah, I think that the um, practice of unpublished opinions, which does vary considerably from circuit to circuit, there's some circuits that do it quite often, there's some like Judge Barrett's circuit that do it virtually never. I think that subject is very much wrapped into the subject of stare decisis for the simple reason that um, the availability of unpublished opinions gives judges a mechanism for kind of avoiding the effects of stare decisis on both ends. It allows judges to say if there's an earlier decision with which they disagree that their subsequent decision isn't going to have any precedential effect and so you don't need to worry about any inconsistency. And conversely, if a judge has a really difficult or uncomfortable question of law, they can issue a decision knowing that it is not going to bind subsequent panels. And again, I think that all of this sort of comes back to an unwillingness to use the available mechanism, the mechanism of end bank review, to ensure the consistency and rectitude of the Court of Appeals decisions. Because after all, uh, uh, we indulge this fiction that a three-judge panel of a Court of Appeals is the court, but where the court as a whole takes a different view, it seems to me that particularly given the stare decisis rules in effect, a court really does have a duty to you know, correct the incorrect panel decision, and I think that that is an outcome that also I think would really aid the Supreme Court in its own decision making because one thing that the Supreme Court doesn't do is to police internal inconsistencies within particular circuits. And in some circuits in particular, the panel that you draw can be very significant to the outcome. Okay, so my last one is for Neil. So I entirely agree with you, Neil, about the importance of stare decisis um, in maintaining an institution and the obligation that judges, and, and you were referencing the Supreme Court in particular, to the justice's responsibility to the institution itself. At the same time, stare decisis itself is a doctrine you know, to which the justices owe stare decisis effect. And as the court has always articulated that doctrine, it's always said that it's not absolute, that there's a time when cases should be overruled and errors corrected. Um, and if that weren't the if that weren't true, you know, Plessy versus Ferguson would still be the law of the land. So there has to be some times, you know, in which precedent ought to be overruled. So I wondered what thoughts you might have about when overruling would not betray a justice's institutional obligations. So um, that's that's a good question, and thanks for giving me an opportunity to elaborate on that. Obviously, I think there are. Um, cases that, and there are a whole series of them, Plessy would be one, uh, the, in the you know, Supreme Court in the Travel Act, or I'm sorry, Travel Ban case, maybe overruled Korematsu or, or wrote a note about it. I don't know what exactly you'd say they did, but there, I mean, there's certainly occasions 
where prior precedent are so undermined that overruling them would be completely appropriate. And, and I think actually much of the, there's the, the Dickerson, I guess think it's called the Miranda case where it decided mm -hmm. not to um, overturn Miranda and went through a number of these various different factors. I think the factors are basically accurate. I think as Cannon said, the problem with the factors and whenever, I think, as usual, Justice uh, Breyer, in one of his opinions, had a six-part test, right? So when you have a six-part test, it's the only thing uh, longer than that would be is hypotheticals. But, um, <laughs> but when I, you, I had one last week that apparently weighed in at three minutes and eight seconds, I'm told, so. <laughs> Unfortunately, that was out of your time, right? Um, <laughs> it's his time, not my time. <laughs> so um, so uh, now I forgot where I was headed. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Like but but with, with a six-part test, the problem with it is that the courts can then manipulate it anywhere they want, really, to come out with a, a conclusion. I think that that, uh, that as an institution, it, the court should be very cautious about overturning prior decisions. And I think things like uh, overturning a 5-4 decision with a 5-4 decision because there have been changes in two justices since the last opinion, I think that's a place where they th should think to themselves, are we actually applying our precedent or are we just exercising power? And if they're just exercising power because they now have five, and frankly, you know, the justices on the Supreme Court, I think for 50 years have been majority appointed by Republican presidents. What hasn't been true, um, and we don't, I don't know this to be true, but I think we're all suspect that this five will be uh, more unified than the, the groups in the, in the past that have had various different justices who went various different directions. And so what I'm worried about is that those factors will be manipulated to really essentially just justify an exercise of power. Can I res respond Absolutely. to one thing that Neil said earlier? I, I would respectfully disagree with the proposition that there is some particular tension between originalism and the doctrine of stare decisis. And actually, I would point to uh, Judge Barrett's and my former boss, Justice Scalia, as sort of an example of that. Uh, Justice Scalia once did famously refer to stare decisis as an exception to originalism, but I think in practice, uh, he was a big believer in stare decisis, certainly more than, than other originalists like Justice Thomas on the court. And I don't think that there's anything inherent in that particular theory of constitutional interpretation that puts it you know, more at war than stare decisis than any other theory other than the fact that uh, you know, it's a, uh, uh, it has been in the ascendancy comparatively recently uh, across the grand arc of, of constitutional interpretation. And so, you know, I think that the question of sort of how to apply stare decisis is one that should really be considered kind of independent of one's substantive theory of constitutional uh, or statutory interpretation. And very similar issues can arise in the context of statutory interpretation as well. The court recently had a case, um, Kimball versus Marvel Technologies, where there was a, you know, a very vigorous back and forth about a prior Supreme Court precedent on statutory interpretation that I think it's fair to say was was decided before 1986, and there was a debate about whether to adhere to that decidedly non-textualist decision. And again, I think you have to try to come up with a theory of stare decisis that is a, a, a neutral one without regard to substance to the extent possible. Can I? Yeah, Do absolutely. Do you mind? Sorry. So, uh, so yeah, I, I understand completely that there's not an inherent inconsistency between uh, uh, originalism and stare decisis. And I really wasn't referring as much to Justice uh, Scalia as to some recent scholarship in the area, which, as I said, suggests a little bit that because the oath is to the Constitution and not to precedent, and because the prior precedent didn't have the benefit of originalism, there's less need to do it. And let me just say on Justice Scalia, you know, the fact that he recognized uh, stare decisis as an exception has actually been one of the criticisms of his adoption of originalism as a if it's a if it's a doctrine, why do you have exceptions to your doctrine? You know, what I mean, if that if that's what you think the appropriate interpretive doctrine is, then how can you admit that there's an exception? And he plainly acknowledged there were a number of exceptions. I'm not getting into originalism, but I do think that at least in the recent scholarship, this is a, a, a sort of a joining of uh, concepts that are that I think we're going to continue to hear about. Yeah, and I think if you were here, I think what he would say is that there are the values that, that Judge Barrett articulated at the outset that stare decisis 
serves, you know, these values in consistency and uniformity and predictability in the law, and those do count for something. Um, I, th I think that was very much his view. And I think he also said, so Ken and I can, are just going to engage in channeling the justice now. <laughs> um, but he did say explicitly that it's an exception to all theories, because all theories would you know, militate sometimes in favor of a result that's at odds with the precedent, but that all theories um, require justices, as Neil said early on, um, to decide cases in ways that they would not otherwise decide if there wasn't precedent on the books. And so that can be true of a more pragmatic approach to interpreting the Constitution as well as to an originalist approach. Um, Stare decisis truly is an independent or more neutral doctrine in that regard. Um, I'm also going to give the panelists, you know, we've had a little bit of conversation back and forth, a chance to ask each other any questions they would like before we open the floor. Well, uh, I just want to say that I don't refer to originalism as a theory. I think of it as the oath that you take. That is, a judge takes an oath to the Constitution as written. That's what originalism is. It's not that you take an oath to whatever vision you have of the Constitution, and that has to undergird uh, the doctrine of precedent and stare decisis. And the problem is that for too many judges and justices, uh, they're in the school of legal realism, otherwise known as what the judge had for breakfast that morning. And that kind of unprincipled, and it's not just on the left, that kind of unprincipled decision making creates a lot of these problems because they're not fitting it to the Constitution. Sometimes they're simply solving the particular problem, which is a common law way of acting in a certain sense. But as Justice Scalia said in his first book, the one published by Princeton, uh, we're common law lawyers in a civil law system. What he meant by that was a written text, which is what the common law did not have. OK, well, how about if I open it up? I don't think, Dean, we don't have a microphone that people can use. Is there a handheld? OK, well, we have a handheld microphone. Right over here. So if anyone would like to ask a question, can feel free. And if not, I'll, I'll fill some airtime by coming up with some more. We Come have on. one right, yeah. Uh, Clark Forsyth with uh, Americans United for Life. Uh, given the six factors of stare decisis, uh, as you alluded to, are um, settled, uh, wrongly decided, uh, workable, uh, legal erosion, factual erosion, and reliance interests, uh, is there really any hope for much coherence uh, you know, between the justices? Uh, wouldn't it be better for the court perhaps to say, uh, you know, was there error, how big was the error, and what's the cost of overruling the error? Ken, and I think that one was for you. I mean, I will, I, 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 I'm not sure that there's that much daylight between the first way you articulated the standard and the second, which is to say that, as I indicated at the outset, I do think that the court's factors really boil down to, you know, sort of the merits and how wrong was the decision, and there are various ways of articulating that. And then the more pragmatic factors that relate to kind of the effects of the decision. And I do think, and this is somewhat in response to Professor Baker, though I largely agree with, with much of what he's had to say, I, I, I do think that this issue of whether the prior decision was not just you know, wrong in terms of the outcome that a justice looking at the issue today would reach free of precedent, but, but whether it, is, it, it reached that result through a methodologically inappropriate outcome is part of the analysis. And, you know, I'll say with regard to Justice Scalia that sort of a, a you know, an example of this, I think, is, uh, you know, there was a case that was decided the year that I clerked called Troxel versus Glanville. It's not a, a case of particularly great broader jurisprudential significance, but it was interesting because it was a case involving, I think, grandparents' rights and substantive due process. And Justice Scalia wrote a very short, but I think very telling separate opinion in that case where he said, look, uh, I, Justice Scalia, am obviously not a believer in substantive due process. There are these earlier cases like Pierce versus Society of Sisters in the context of parental rights. And I'm not sure that those decisions are right, but you know, I'm, I, I'm just not going to be willing to extend them. I'm willing to abide by them, but I'm not going to be willing to extend them. And I think that that sort of reflects the way that he approached uh, sort of the balance between originalism and stare decisis. I think in his view, 
if there was a decision on the books that he thought was wrong, but that was not working much broader mischief in the law, he was perfectly happy to say that decision uh, uh, can, can remain in effect. I would make the distinction there that he would do that on Bill of Rights questions, but not on structural questions. On structural questions, I mean, he was ready to overturn Humphrey's executor. Yeah, that'd be pretty big. Yeah, and I think yeah. that, that reflects his view that those are questions on which, you know, I mean, for one thing, again, as I indicated at the outset, I don't know that you can really readily apply the reliance factor as a thumb on the scale on those sorts of structural the questions. The only people relying on it are Washington law firms. Right. That the <laughs> <laughs> I would that that were a significant factor in any of the court's analysis. And let's just say, whatever the law is, it doesn't really matter to us. We'll deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. I think right behind you. Um, Joe Cosby from Washington, D.C. I am kind of struck, I mean, it's particularly when you're talking about the reliance factor. I don't think there could be a better example than the Erie versus, um, Erie, uh, versus uh, Tom, uh, the railroad yeah. uh, overturning Swift, because that was a bolt of thunder out of blue. I mean, nobody was looking to overturn Swift. I don't think the oral arguments that anybody suggested that. Um, and so, you know, and that's clearly one of the most important precedents that we have now, and the reliance factor in that one completely out. And I'm wondering, as I'm listening to this, it sounds to me as though there may be a tension between those who would want to um, rely on stare decisis in order to protect the practical uh, questions that, that you seek to protect, and um, someone who would be more inclined to be uncomfortable with stare decisis if it in involves a, um, a, a logical issue, that it then becomes very difficult to fit the pieces of the law together under the particular approach or theory that you're using to interpret it, because, you know, and that, and that might. So uh, to kind of boil it down, What's more important when you're talking about stare decisis? Is it the practical factors and the things that you've got in front of you right now, or is it the theoretical or uh, you know the logical consistency and being able to have a rule that can be understood and applied along those lines? Now, John is eager to answer this. Well, a couple of things. Again, to quote Justice, then Justice Scalia, I'm sorry, Rehnquist, who said to a student who asked a similar question, he responded, he says, if you're looking for consistency, you're in the wrong business. <laughs> and the problem here is that it, as wonderful a justice as I think Rehnquist was, he was the ultimate legal realist. I mean, he was a federalist, but he was an ultimate legal realist, and he was just better at it than, than some of the other legal realists on, on the court. You point to Erie. Erie was the only case, as far as I know, to ever declare a prior decision of the Supreme Court unconstitutional. And what that really marked was this huge shift from the way the court had viewed things. And, and Swift says, court opinions are not law, okay? And that drove Holmes nuts. And Brandeis vindicated Holmes in the Erie case. That under, that foundation has a lot to do where you're stepping as to how you view precedent and stare decisis. I'll interject one thing there, too. One thing about Erie um, that's very interesting is that it overruled Swift distinguishing between statutory and constitutional precedents, saying that if only a question of statutory interpretation were involved, then we might let it lie. But because this is a question of constitutional interpretation, then we're going to overrule it. Overrule it. And the court has distinguished between statutory and constitutional cases because in constitutional cases, if it doesn't correct the error, it can be corrected only by constitutional amendment, which is, of course, an onerous process. So, you know, the Kimball case that Cannon was mentioning earlier, that was one of the reasons to not overrule it, was it was a statutory, a case of statutory interpretation. I mean, the, the baseball antitrust. Um, you know, exemption is an example of that. So I don't know if you all yeah, have I, views on that. I wonder that. if there'll be some softening in that, and that may be reflected in the views of the dissenters in Kimball, you know, in part because, as Judge Barrett says, the rationale for this distinction is that, you know, amending the Constitution is really hard. Um, amending a statute, in theory, should be easy. 
But as we see Congress getting ever and ever more dysfunctional and unable to pass even the most basic legislation, I wonder whether there'll be a sense that, you know, even amending a statute is not an easy thing to do. You know, and I think that that has kind of affected the court's statutory interpretation more generally. But I think on this specific question of statutory stare decisis, one could see that having an effect as well, particularly where you do have, you know, there are a lot of statutory interpretations, decisions on the books that bear no resemblance to how any of the current members of the court would approach the task of statutory interpretation. You know, if you go into that pre-1986 era, it's not hard to find decisions that don't even attempt to confront the text of a statute at all. And I think Kimball and other cases sort of reflect the problem of what happens when the modern court encounters a precedent of that variety. So, so let me uh, sort of uh, frankly agree with that. And it may be partially from my perch in the White House for the last three years of the Obama administration. But the civics class teaches you that Congress can change statutes if it uh, sees fit. And both houses pass a bill and it gets put on the president's desk. But unless it's included in the omnibus, which funds the government at the end of the year, it's just not really happening. I'm sure people in the room will know lots that have happened, but Lily Ledbetter is probably the last one that I actually remember, which was early in the Obama administration where the Ledbetter decision was overturned uh, by statute. I can't really think of one since. There probably are. There may be some in the sort of national security area where the, where the court every once in a while does things that uh, Congress doesn't like. But, but that sort of civics class approach, I think, and per particularly people like uh, uh, now Justice Kavanaugh, who spent you know, a fair amount of time in that milieu as well, is probably also going to be equally skeptical that, that not to worry if this is a problem, Congress can just fix it. I think that people are unlikely to continue to think that. I mean, think back to... Um Northern Pipeline, where the court actually famously and somewhat mm -hmm. controversially stayed its hand on a statutory interpretation question so that Congress could have the chance to amend the Bankruptcy Act. I'm not sure that the court would ever do that nowadays because they would have no confidence that Congress was going to act if there was a problem that needed Congress to address. Right there in the back. Thank you. I'm uh, John Giacaris. I'm with the Chicago Federalist Society. Uh, I'm going to ask you guys to uh, handicap the uh, court on uh, stare decisis going forward. Um, up until now, the Roberts Court has sort of established a reputation for being the stare decisis court. Uh, previous courts, according to an analysis from the Volokh Conspiracy, uh, the Berger, uh, Warren, and Rehnquist courts would overturn a precedent of about an average of two to three per term. And the Roberts Court, at least up until recently, was an average of about one per term. This past term was an exception. I think they overturned three major precedents, um, which was a lot for them. But going forward, do you, do you still see the Roberts Court as being the stare decisis court? Or is that average going to bump up more? And what do you say to the theory that um, a lot of the bad cases sort of have, have already been overturned at this point, so there might not be many left to have to do it? Um, so I'm certain people could think of others they don't like, actually. Uh, <laughs> but look, you know, sort of my opening remarks were largely a cry to the court to be cautious about exercising its newfound power. I don't really know how it's going to come out. I'm going to quote something that I read getting ready for this, but I want to be quite clear that I've not checked it myself, so it may not be accurate. So if people are tweeting, uh, don't be too vicious about it. Um, but there was something I read that said that uh, Justice Gorsuch in 60 cases uh, suggested that 10 of the court's precedents should be reconsidered um, last term. That's a lot. Um, I don't, they weren't all at issue in the, precisely in the case that, uh, that was under decision. But that's a lot to suggest should be uh, reviewed. Um, and uh, so, I, I look, I, I hope that the court will recognize the situation that it's in at the moment and will proceed with great caution. And, and uh, ever since November of 2016, I'm out of the prediction business. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy, I, I have a couple of thoughts, but John, do you have? I was just going to refer to the Wayfair case, which overturned things. Uh, on a non-ideological, basically, issue. Internet taxation, a lot at stake in there. But it's also ripe for further overturning because 
Um, Thomas and Gorsuch went along with the narrow holding, but it's pretty clear that they basically don't agree with the Dharma Commerce Clause. So what does that portend? A lot more unsettled precedent. Yeah, and I would just add a couple of things. I mean, first of all, I think it really is true just as a, um, a, 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 an empirical matter that the court overturned precedents more frequently in the pre-Roberts years. Um, you know, the irony is that the very first case that the Chief Justice argued a fairly quotidian question involving the double jeopardy clause was a case where the court overturned its decision like eight years later. Uh, and this was, of course, uh, in the days of the Rehnquist Court. And I think it's largely because I think the Chief Justice is very reluctant to overrule precedents unless there's really no choice but to do it. And there are a number of areas of the law in which you could argue that the court under his leadership has, has sort of gutted prior precedents without expressly overruling them. And then conversely, cases where the court has said that prior precedents are overruled in the court of history, a court that I hope to inf appear in front of one day, since that's, <laughs> not, that's still one on my bucket list. But, um, <laughs> but, I, but I think in all seriousness, that I, I think that the Chief Justice you know, doesn't, uh, I, I think he doesn't like the optics of the court being seen to overrule prior precedent. Sometimes there's no choice because that's the sole question before the court, as was true in uh, uh, South Dakota versus Wafer. And of course, there he, he famously dissented um, from uh, the overruling of Bellis Haas and Quill. I'll add, and, and I know Cannon won't uh, disagree with this, that the court does have a choice. It just happens earlier in the cert grant. So a way that the court, I mean, I think actually a primary way that the Supreme Court contributes to stability is not to grant cert when the question presented is, do you want to overrule a precedent? And I think that if the court is looking to keep things calm, it will be in the nature of that and just declining to take up cases in which overruling precedent would be on the table. Can I also defend um, Justice Gorsuch um, from what Neil said a little bit? I mean, I do think that when a justice is writing separately, it's pretty rare for a justice to, to confront the sort of hypothetical question of, of whether those decisions, in fact, you know, are now overruled. Um, uh, there would be something artificial about doing that. And so I think that when Justice Gorsuch or Justice Thomas writes a separate opinion that attempts to kind of reason from first principles, uh, you know, I don't think that you can always um, uh, say that if the justice you know, was confronted with the question of whether or not to overrule the precedents, the justice would in fact do so. I think it, those sorts of opinions obviously are very influential in directing the law, and I would respectfully submit that there's probably no justice who's been more effective in that regard than Justice Thomas over the last uh, 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 20 or so years. But I, I, I think that it's sort of a quite separate question when you're actually confronted with the binary choice because that's where all these other considerations come into play. Another question? There's one in the back of the room. Um, thanks. Uh, Ian Milheiser with Think Progress. I think this is primarily a question for you, Cannon, but if other folks want to weigh in, I, I'm open. Um, you drew this distinction between, I guess, structural decisions and, I guess, not structural decisions and how there might be less of a call for stare decisis in structural cases because there's fewer reliance interests. And I, I just wanted to tease that out because I'm not, I'm not sure if that's empirically True. Like, I mean, it is the case that if, you know, we're talking about changing administrative law, that the defendant might be the United States or it might be a federal agency. But if it's an environmental case, like power plants have built their plants relying on this interest and they would have, relying on the regulation being there, and they would have had a different, they would have built it differently otherwise. And I could give an example from the labor context, I could give that an example from the healthcare context. So like, I'm just trying to figure out, you know, how, how, how do you draw that box when there will always be third parties who, even if they aren't involved in this particular litigation, have made decisions based on the regulation and in some cases have benefited tremendously from the regulation? Or I'll add on to the end of Ian's question too, I mean, Wickard versus Filburn, I mean, is that structural? 
Yeah, well, to sort of tackle the first part of that, <laughs> um, I think what makes questions of administrative law a, a little bit different, at least if you're thinking about sort of the questions about, you know, our and Chevron and the like that have been very much in the news, is that those questions seem, you know, one step removed from the immediate question that a court is considering, which is, of course, you know, is this particular regulation valid? Is this per per should this particular statute be interpreted in a, a particular way? And obviously, the interests of private parties comes into play in a very real sense with regard to that specific question. You know, that that individual litigant presumably doesn't care so much about whether or not you know our is still a good law, except insofar as it implicates their particular interest in that particular regulation or statute. So I think that that's one potential ground for distinction. I haven't, I won't profess to be enough of an expert in the court's, you know, overall stare decisis um, jurisprudence to know, for instance, how the court has looked at reliance into interests in the Commerce Clause context and whether they've, you know, taken into account the interests of uh, individual uh, uh, parties in, in those particular contexts. But I do think it's fair to say that when you're dealing with these structural constitutional questions, at a minimum, and again, subject to exception, those individual interests tend to be a little more indirect. I want to talk ahead, about Wickard for a minute. I'm glad you brought up Wickard. I, I thought that, it might stir things up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good example of how you can, and I've done it before, I've gone back and looked at all the Commerce Clause cases leading up to Wickard, and if you take a narrow approach to the holding, you can uphold all of those cases before Wickard without all the language in those cases. You leave those cases standing. You can't leave Wickard standing if you really want to go back to an understanding of the Commerce Clause as you find in Gibbons, which was extremely textual. It actually read the words and applied the words, an unusual thing. There is no such thing as the Interstate Commerce Clause. That's a term that comes from a statute. Go back and read the text. Reread Gibbons, and then you can look at those cases differently. I think reliance interests, too, can be structural or government. The government can have reliance interests, not just individuals. And I think that the formulation of stare decisis doctrine is capacious enough to encompass the reliance of institutions um, on doctrines, like Commerce Clause doctrine, for example. Next question. So there was some discussion before on um, how, the, how if there was a, a five to four decision it would more or less be a show of raw judicial power. And my question is this, um, how do we reconcile if the five four decision was to actually punt um, some questions of law to states or to other branches of government to handle? Would that in essence then not be a raw judicial exercise of power? It would rather be the Supreme Court decentralizing its power to other branches. Takers? I, without something more specific, I don't know how to answer that question. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. I'm a little bit in the same boat. I wasn't quite sure where you were headed with that. And so, um, so it leaves Canon to give the smart answer. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's I, think mistake, I, think, I think we're unanimous on that. <laughs> Right, right in front of you. Hey, a uh, quick question for Mr. Eggleston. Um, so it seems like everybody on the panel um, agrees, including you, if I understand you correctly, that um, nobody wants an all-powerful or a political Supreme Court, a judicial aristocracy legislating from the bench, for example. But um, originalism, um, as I understood, you describe it sounds a little bit more like a passing trend or fade, um, what are your thoughts on, um, I guess, the decisions that were made that are, previous decisions made by the Supreme Court that are at odds with the Constitution? Um, would that be an uh, occasion where, in your opinion, it would be appropriate to reverse previous decisions? So I missed a critical word. Did you say previous decisions that are at odds with originalism? Was that... Pre uh, previous decisions that are at odds with the Constitution. So, um, or I'll add to that. 
either at odds with the Constitution or just written into the Constitution, but not actually formally written into it? Well, um, so look, obviously the Constitution controls. It, you're, the, the, the danger in this area, I think, and let me just correct one thing. I have no idea if originalism is gonna be a passing fad or not, and I didn't mean to suggest that. It could be that it's gonna catch on. All I meant is, that if it is, then people who are advocating a particular way of dealing with it are going to uh, have to accept the counter, you know, the, the blowback if it goes a different direction. So I was making no prediction uh, about that at all. I mean, obviously, the Constitution controls. I think that the danger in this area is the sense that, um, that a particular court can get it right and the prior court got it wrong. Do you know what I mean? So what, what your question implies is a certainty about how the case should come out. Um, and it rarely exists. All the cases that are high profile are 5-4, basically, or 6-3. Even the justices don't, the justices rarely agree. And so the notion, and look, this last term we saw Justice Thomas and Justice Gorsuch fight about you know, sort of originalism and, and where originalism would take them in various different cases. And I thought to myself, well, look, I thought this was a doctrine that all you had to do was apply neutrally and the answer would come out. How can two people who are espousing the same philosophy actually disagree with each other on where this whole thing ends up? I thought the neutrality of it was one of the things that was to its benefit. So I think that the assumption really of the question is sort of what I was worried about, which is a notion oh, Th that uh, originalism, they'll, they'll, all, they'll disagree with me. They would do, <laughs> we're, they'll we're, do it we're, if we're, we're having lunch. We're, ju we're just lining up. <laughs> so uh, I think the danger, and, and as I said earlier, the, the thing about stare decisis is, is an agreement that the prior decision is going to be sustained even if the current justices don't agree with it. That's the whole theory of it. You don't need stare decisis if you agree with the prior decision. And I think that there's a, a certainty of rightness that, that sort of comes out of that, and I think that's a dangerous place to be. Very a few of these cases, is there a, uh, a certainty of rightness, basically? The courts are always split, and, uh, and disagreeing with prior uh, justices, I just think that, I think there's a hubris that comes with that, that, that the justices should be very careful about. There's a misunderstanding on, on I think, your part, and many people's part, about what originalism is. I mean, it's not the notion that because you apply neutral principles that every originalist is going to come to the same conclusion and the same set of facts and law. I mean, Scalia and Thomas didn't always agree. So that's not the principle. And the, the real principle, I think, was best expressed by Lincoln regarding Dred Scott. He said the reason why normally we adhere to precedent is because when things are ambiguous, and the people don't object to it. We settle it, and it becomes approved by the people. He substituted the people for parliament. It becomes accepted as part of the fabric of the law. But there are certain few decisions that are so disruptive and rejected by ordinary citizens that they cannot re be regarded as a precedent. So he urged his uh, party members in the Congress to certainly respect the judgment in Dred Scott, you couldn't free him, but reject the precedent. Yeah, and I would just add, I mean, I, first of all, I would just underscore that, you know, regardless of, of one's methodology, there are hard cases, and there are hard cases for originalists where originalists can disagree, and that certainly is also true in the area of statutory interpretation, where there are often very hard <coughs> cases for textualists, and even with the constraining mechanism of textualism, there are cues on the face of a statute that might point in different directions. Um, so, you know, I don't know that that has, has much of a bearing on kind of the, the appropriate role of stare decisis. It's just a reflection of the fact that that regardless of one's approach, there, uh, you know, there are cases that, uh, that uh, a judge or justice is going to struggle with. I do think that the, that the reality is that regardless of whether you characterize originalism as, as a methodology or not, uh, there are different methodological approaches on the current Supreme Court to constitutional interpretation, which will probably be the most obvious of the many obvious things I've said today. And that is really the reason why I would respectfully submit that um, stare decisis is 
a relatively weak principle in the constitutional area. And Judge Barrett has written very thoughtfully about this precise issue where you have justices who have deep methodological commitments, that tends to cause them to think that prior precedents may not just be incorrect, but be profoundly so because the court was using the wrong approach in those prior decisions. And so, you know, I think that that explains the reality that we live in a world in which, uh, you know, stare decisis again is not a, a mechanical or inexorable command. You have a variety of prudential factors that uh, uh, different judges and justices are going to balance differently. I, I would agree, but I'd just add this. The methodological differences are tied further back to different visions of what the Constitution is, because you can't have a methodology unless you know what the method is all about. Now, some of them I know at, historically had n not a clue about what it was about. I mean, Justice Blackman, I heard him famously say, he said, till I got to the Supreme Court, I had no idea what my constitutional philosophy was. Well, when you start from ground zero, when you get there, and you just start with, with a methodology, you're, you're putting it together and you don't have any real clear idea, and that, then you become terribly unpredictable. I'll just add the footnote to say that, that I don't think methodological disagreement alone, though, is a reason for overruling cases. In many ways, stare decisis mediates that because if everyone on the court had the same approach to constitutional interpretation, we'd probably see very few cases. I mean, you'd have some cases where, you know, Justices Thomas and Gorsuch might be duking it out over what was the right um, interpretation. But one of the great functions of stare decisis, I think, is to mediate methodological disagreement because it is methodological disagreement that provides the occasions for overruling. Is there a question? Ready to go over there? I also can't see because of the light from that side. So, OK. Right, right up there. Ilya Soman, George Mason University. Uh, the panelists and also the Supreme Court talks about reliance interests and so how sometimes we might need to stick to a flawed precedent to protect people who have been relying on it. I wonder if the panel could talk about the flip side, which is situations where uh, in a long-standing but flawed precedent has caused harm, potentially even great harm. Should that harm be considered? Should it be weighed against the benefits to those who have reliance interests? And if so, you know, how would you do that cost-benefit analysis? Like, uh, obviously, one reason why we think it was correct to get rid of Plessy versus Ferguson is precisely because of the great harm and not merely because there was flaws in the court's logic. But if that was true of Plessy, maybe it can be true of other decisions. Uh, Wickard was mentioned before, clearly some people benefit from it, but there are also others who were harmed, the whole purpose of the law upheld there was to uh, raise food prices in the midst of a depression where people were already suffering from malnutrition in many cases. Uh, so should both benefit and harm be weighed? And if so, is there any kind of neutral calculus that can be used to do that? I think Wayfair was a good example of that where um, Justice Kennedy was looking at harms he did a calculation which was disputed by Roberts, and Roberts was going on the other side, reliance. And the question is, should that case have been decided at all? Should it have been decided that way? Or should it have gone to Congress? Congress had the opportunity before. They didn't do anything. But does that mean because they didn't do anything, something should have been done? I mean, in Wayfair, there was a debate between the majority and the dissent about you know, how expensive it was going to be yeah. for parties to comply with the rule, right? And you know, that they were gonna to have to get software to keep track of like the state and local uh, tax regime, the patchwork that was gonna result. And so I, I think you don't get much more brass tacks than that. And they didn't do a very good job of it because they, they, can't, they can't do what a congressional committee can do. I mean, one of my favorite random facts about that case was I saw a, something on Twitter, and so therefore it must have been true that in the immediate aftermath of the decision, the value of the stock of the company that produces the software for companies to account for this tax like soared. And so, you know, 
it, uh, 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 I, I, maybe that vindicated the concern and maybe it didn't, I don't know. So I just, uh, uh, so I, I agree with you. I think that the existing jurisprudence though sort of accounts for that. I think workability of a rule is typically one of the th places that they look. The, the difference is that uh, uh, the reliance interests are, are people who the case comes down and they, uh, they conform their conduct to benefit from the rule. So they've actually, I think the thought is they've acted in a way to, that assumes that the rule is going to be in, in existence, which is different. The people who are being harmed, at least they know what the rule is. And so they know how to adjust their conduct in a way to make maybe have less harm. And I think that's why the reason that we talk more about reliance interests, because those are the ones presumably who have actually organized their affairs in conformance with what they thought the law was going to be, then for the Supreme Court to change it means that that whatever investment they did, and as my colleagues have said, there's a significant amount of back and forth uh, on that uh, on that between the majority and the dissent in Wafer. Yeah, one up here. Thank you for the panel. Um, this is a question from Stegelson. Um, I want to extend the uh, earlier question. Um, I didn't take your prepared remarks to mean that uh, you, your, your concern about the shoving aside of stare decisis would mean that you would never over, overrule a uh, prior case. <clears throat> I mean, I suspect in 1954, you probably would have not have extended the principles underlying Plessy versus Ferguson. But um, what criteria would you actually use? Um, like two or three bullet points that would guide you in a decision whether or not to overrule? Well, I actually um, don't think I can do any better than the Supreme Court precedent, the, the Dickerson, the legging, or whatever the case. You guys are better at case names than I am, I'm sure, by a long shot. But so, you know, sort of the three or four cases that discuss, and I think we talked about some of them, Justice Breyer's six-part test, which is, uh, uh, you know, how, how fundamentally wrong the prior decision is, reliance interests, as we've talked about. There's a whole series. So I think that's pretty much where I would be. Um, where I would not be is, we got five now, so we should do it. That's where I would not be. There's one right here. Perfect. Thank you to the panel for coming here and speaking. I'm Josiah Colmeyer. I'm a law clerk uh, on the Fifth Circuit. And my question is specifically for Dr. Baker. Your idea of popular acquiescence and- It's and, Lincoln's, not mine. Oh, oh <laughs> yes. No, absolutely, Lincoln's. How, how, can we, how can we guard and weigh that against the idea that oftentimes important Supreme Court decisions defend the unpopular how do we ensure that the populace can't, in essence, overrule the Supreme Court? Well, we have to look behind just the courts. I mean, that's why we have a separation of power system. Uh, we don't just have a court system. And as the framers understood, you needed the three separate branches to maintain the kind of stability and justice in the country. I mean, that's the short answer to your question. You know, I'd like the panel, if they could, to talk about the negative effects of stare decisis on individual liberty. It seems to me that the imposition of a past case to a present case forecloses uh, the fact patterns of an individual case in controversy. And I'm just really concerned that while it may bring court stability, it may bring stability to the law, it may bring stability to actors that rely on the law, or that consider it a law and not simply an opinion, um, that, that individual liberty is, is uh, watered down, is negatively impacted uh, by this idea that, that the judges could make a pronouncement, for example, on a Texas case that applies across the whole country and not only to that case and controversy, the parties before it. Um, and I'm, I'm looking for some discussion on that. <sighs> The, the person who's done the most on this is Judge Barrett. <laughs> I'm the moderator, not the panelist. <laughs> uh, I've experienced that very frustration that you're talking about. Uh, it, yes, it is extremely frustrating. 
And the difficulty in our federal system is that when the Supreme Court went from being a court of errors to be a, a court that resolves conflicts, it's in the nature of the structure, and there is no good answer to what you say. But yes, having experienced it of arguing a case dependent on another case that was previously argued and decided before I had my brief in, that was very frustrating because I thought I had arguments that weren't considered in the case that resolved my case. Yeah, I don't have an answer to it. And that, and that does happen all the time. And um, to pick up uh, where uh, Professor Baker started, you know, there's no better place to start in thinking about this issue than I think um, Judge Barrett's first article on stare decisis, which talks about kind of the due process aspect and, and looks at this from the perspective of individual litigants. And you know, to pick up on something I said at the outset, I, um, I think that if you are in a world in which it is practically impossible to raise your arguments because of the way in which the rules are being applied, that that is a very real problem. And I think that where that really does typically meet the road is at the Court of Appeals level, where you can have you know, a situation much like the one that Professor Baker has indicated, where there may be another case that is right out in front of yours. It may have worse lawyers. The arguments may be presented worse. And you may be the victim of stare decisis rules in that context simply by virtue of having come second. That seems like a context in which the unfairness seems at its peak. But I think in particular, again, at the Court of Appeals level, if that end bank mechanism is not available, you know, a party can very easily be out of luck if there is a prior precedent from the circuit and there may not be a circuit conflict, because if you can't get to the end bank court, you can't necessarily get anywhere. The district court's going to be bound by that prior precedent. You won't be able to get in bank review, and you probably won't be able to get cert unless you have a circuit conflict. And again, that's a context in which that unfairness seems at its greatest. Did you want to add, Neil? Or? Well, I, so I've also read your article. And since Kirkland's based in Chicago, I think I won't comment on it more than that. Um, <laughs> but I do think in some ways, on the, on the Court of Appeals uh, level, if you think about the other way it would work, which is that every panel gets a new shot at every new issue, they would be in bonk all the time. And so it, it's a. I guess I'm not that troubled. It works on the district court level, obviously, as everybody up here knows, which is district courts in a district are not bound by decisions by other district courts in their, in their district. So you're not, if some district court rules against you, you're not, you're not the, the next district judge isn't really bound. But as a matter of how you would proceed, you would have a lot of unbox. And, and I guess it sort of presumes um, that the Court of Appeals is not properly exercising its unbank capability. And maybe that's the real solution to it. I agree people, I mean, technically people aren't precluded. They can bring their action, they can lose in the, in the whatever panel they have, they can seek unbank review and they can seek Supreme Court review. Nobody stops them from making all those attempts up the line. There's no, in my view, deprivation of due process. They can do it, it's just, because of the way our system has worked, the likelihood of getting a real review is much less because unfortunately, I actually think, although, and, and uh, Ken and I talked about this a little bit, I mean, in, even in the Ninth Circuit, Umbach isn't really Umbach. It is a subset <laughs> of Umbach. Uh, and I don't quite know how they've sorted through uh, kind of all those issues. But I, but I think there's a practicality to this. And without significantly more on box, I don't know how else that, that you would really do it. And, and court, well, I, you know, Judge Barrett is here. I mean, courts of appeals tend not to like on box because it is so uh, time consuming for the judges because then every, all the judges have to get ready on every, any particular issue, which has always struck me as the reason that they don't uh, particularly I mean, I, do it. I think it. there are w ways of dealing with that. And the Seventh Circuit has, you know, I think an excellent way of deal dealing with that. I'm not just saying that because we have cases in the Seventh Circuit and Judge Barrett's <laughs> here. I, they, they have an internal and bank mechanism that I think they use to kind of police um, uh, intra-circuit conflicts or inter-circuit uh, conflicts where opinions are circulated internally, and that I think addresses a lot of the efficiency concern. But you know, it's really striking when you look at the statistics. Actually, by far, the majority of end banks in the country occur in the Ninth Circuit, and it's this strange kind of mechanism where end bank doesn't really mean end bank. There are other circuits where you know they there were at least three circuits last year where there weren't any end bank reviews at all. And I've heard judges say that you know. 
it's sort of viewed as discourteous when you're reviewing the work of your peers, and it sort of creates internal fractiousness. And to me, you know, that may be true, but I don't know that that rises to the level of a constitutional value that we're concerned the judges might not get along as well if they embanked each other more often. Another question? We have one right here. So this is the um, elephant in the room, and I think, Judge, you probably will not want to respond to this one. But uh, here in the panel today, one of the things that they look at is whether the impact of applying the stare decisis is going to be constitutional or legislative. Biggest case we hear this discussed about is Roe versus Wade. And it appears that on both sides of Roe versus Wade, a number of justices and judges have commented that it was not a well-decided decision, wasn't well-based. And then when you add to that the changes in um, science and other issues, it seems that it would be one that would be ripe for a court to want to revisit. And so my question is, how does the impact of the political issue, because the, the third part of that is, do we allow the legislature, which is supposed to be reflecting the interests of its people, make these kinds of decisions, or do we allow the courts to make these decisions? But if it's constitutionally determined to have been a poor decision, then it's no longer really a decision for the courts, it's a decision for the legislature. So how do we balance that with the horrendous political atmosphere that then deals with a decision like this in makes it very difficult to ever revisit. Canon? <laughs> Why me? Because I heard you agree that if it's a constitutional issue, it's more likely to be visited than if it's a statutory issue. So, uh, you know, I will say this. Uh, look, there are obviously hot button areas of the law, and I think you just mentioned one, but there are numerous others where people feel very strongly about the rights and wrongs of prior decisions. I think it's all the more reason why it's important to try to articulate these principles neutrally. This is part and parcel of the exercise of the rule of law that you've got to try to come up with the best possible, most objective principles for stare decisis. I just think, um, however, that when it comes to something this broad, this is really sort of a, on, on some level kind of a, a methodological question in and of itself, and it's just really hard. I mean, I think really smart people have tried to come up with more concrete standards for stare decisis, and it has just, uh, 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 it, it just is not susceptible to that. So I wish, I wish there were a sort of a, a clear answer, whether in that context or any other, but I just think that the best that judges and, and justices can do is to try to articulate those principles neutrally, and I think there's been a lot of thoughtful scholarship, again, including Judge Barrett's articles, uh, on the broader subject. Nothing to add? Uh, I would fall back on Lincoln's statement. <laughs> <laughs> Neil? Well, I mean, I don't know that anybody in this room cares what I think about this, but I will. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll offer a few thoughts very quickly to let you uh, get back to your dessert or something. Look, uh, you know, the, it, it's, the, the case has been uh, unreversed for 40 years. I don't know how long, maybe longer than that. Somebody can do the math. But it's, and it has been um, upheld over and over and over again. I know there's a significant portion of the populace that don't like it and have never liked it. I think there's a significant reliance interest. I think it's been, ba I, think in the, I think that's what he meant by the, the uh, Lincoln comment. I think it's, it's um, uh, an accepted right at this point and that it would be inappropriate for this court to overrule it, that it satisfies all the conditions of being sustained. And that's, that's where I am on that. And with that, we've hit 1.30. So thank you to our panelists. Thank you.